Okay, now it is really uh, a sincere pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Mr. Fernando Ponce. Uh, Fernando is an outreach specialist for the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation. His areas of responsibility include up here in Northern California, the Central Coast, and the Bay Area. He goes around and he provides uh, very informational presentations in both English and Spanish uh, to students, senior citizens, uh, military groups, uh, new citizens, and uh, veteran groups. So he's he moves around a lot. And uh, he will also today educate us about current and emerging scams involving uh, various financial services, including cybercrime, bank fraud, online scams, and phishing attacks. And don't we all need to have this kind of information? I mean, we really do. So welcome, Fernando. Thank you so much for being here. Let's give him a big round of applause. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you for being the biggest group so far for me this year. This is awesome. I really appreciate it. Um, before I get started, I do a lot of uh, these events at local senior centers, and oftentimes it's a one or two or nobody. So I'm really happy to see everybody here. You know, but when that one person goes, right, I'm really excited and I'm really happy because they're like, thank you for this information. I'm going to share it. And usually that person will get me another presentation, another presentation, because, you know, you guys are very, uh, uh, a tight knit group. So, you know, getting these younger folks to get invited. I know it's difficult because you know, oh, someone's always selling you something, right? And finally, you know, that's my pitch. Like, hey, trust me, guys, I'm not selling you a protection program. I'm from the state. We're all we're all good to go. So I appreciate you guys being here. Let's go ahead and get this presentation going. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we do, who we are, and why I'm here. And it's a little bit of stuff that's in the current news. So again. I'm with DFPI. None of you have ever heard of us. Don't lie to me. I know you've never heard of DFPI. Now go ahead, next slide. Oh, I have the clicker, actually. Yeah, okay. Okay, so we regulate uh, providers and consumer financial products by basically examining companies, ensuring they're compliant with the law. We take action when companies break the law. We investigate consumer complaints, and we do educational outreach. Ignore all that. Let's think of the current event at San Jose. Everybody knows about that Silicon Valley Bank. Us, along with the federal government, essentially took over that bank, took the books, and because they were breaking the law, they're a local credit union or, or a state credit union. So that's the type of investigations we do, whether it's minor of you think you're a transactional fraud has happened at a bank or a company committed fraud, all the way to the biggest banks where basically they were you know negative in the book. So that was us taking over with the federal government. So that's like the grand, the big picture is that we can actually take over a bank, go in there and like leave the books take all the employees out and take over and run it until we sort of get new management. So that's the big uh, grand scheme of thing of what we do. Well, so how does that equate to you? Because sort of we're a financial regulator, um, a lot of the complaints we get from consumers to the banks is after the fact, it's after the fraud, right? So so what good is it if we regulate a company when the bank already let the fraud go through, right? And so essentially we're preventive of, of fraud. Obviously you can still file a complaint and talk about that, but you know we're here to prevent you from giving that report to the bank because essentially it's already gone, right? You've already transferred the money and you file your complaint with the bank and they go, well, it's gone already. You know, it, it's, and we're a big bank. We don't have time to educate you. Well, here at the state, we have time to educate you and that's why I'm here. So some of the, the organizations that we regulate, banks, credit unions, pay as you go financing, that's sort of, sort of like buy now, pay later, that's really growing on the internet. And so that's some of the thing that, you know, something to look for that these products change, we regulate them. We also, you know, money transfers, that's my money transfer, the same thing as Apple Pay or Venmo or Zelle, right? I'll, oftentimes it's getting uh, little, uh, watered down, I would say. Just transfer me the money over the phone. It's a money wire. You're wiring money over your phone, but they make it so convenient, but it's still like it's the same thing as a, as a wire where it's, it's permanent, right? We, we regulate them as well as, you know, deferred deposit, payday loans, investments, California mortgage lenders, repair companies, and debt collectors. So these are some of the companies that we regulate. Essentially, any company that requires to have you tap to pay for something, we're going to regulate them on a, on a state scale and national scale as well. So when you go to the store and you tap your credit card, that company, that, that little machine has a license from us. So, you know, in the grand scheme of things, let's say you think a company defrauded you or there was something happened with your account. 
you could file a complaint because maybe there's something that they're not protecting their company and then and then hence the consumer. So if they if they if they you're paying for something in California, we'll regulate them. And so you can always file a complaint to see, you know, if they're doing something that's illegal purposely or obviously not their fault. So what I'm going to talk about today, a little bit of uh, what to look for for copycat websites, password alerts, two-step verification, social media scam, and making sure your network is secure when you're doing any kind of searching. So the first one, this is really, this is a really easy one to, to think about is a secure connection. You have the key, you have the S, no key, no S. What does that say? Essentially mean this is encrypted. You and the company have a protection that, uh, that uh, assures you that your information is being protected from outside hackers. So it doesn't mean that hackers exist in the red here. It just means you don't know if someone actually has taken over this website. And essentially, even the person that has that website doesn't even know as soon as you put in your credit card information you're, and it's being stolen right away. This says they have the certificate that they're protecting between you and them. This means they don't have it. So you don't know if it's, if it's actually being protected or not. For example, if there is a local vendor, oftentimes they don't have the certificate, right? So if it's a mom and pop, I don't think someone's scamming you. You're not putting in your credit card, so you're not going to get defrauded that way. But if you're going to a big box store or what you think is a, a actual producer of products that you're buying something, and this is not here, it's something to look, watch out for because your information can get stolen. It doesn't mean it will be, but maybe they don't even know. They don't have this sort of set uh, protection on the website. That's a number one red flag. Now, here are some red flags that are pretty easy, and we all miss them because we still commit. For, we still are getting defrauded by going to these websites. So first, physical address and phone number. So if you go to a website and maybe you're, you're, it looks a little funky or it looks weird, look up the address and the phone number of their headquarters. It sounds silly, but I guarantee you if you Google map that, it's going to be a barn in Kentucky. And trust me, because it happened to me. I said, I, I needed a, a car part. And I said, that's really good, cheap car part. I really need it for my car. It's like almost half off. I look up the headquarters. It was literally a barn in Kentucky. So red flag number one. And the website was really good, but that, web, that address was wrong. So number two, return policy. Obviously, a lot of these websites are made like internationally. So they say no returns or two-day return. How are you going to return a product in two days, right? And here we do you know, 30, 60, 90, right, a return policy. So if the return policy is kind of wacky or all sales are final, that's a red flag. That website might be fraudulent. Obviously, this one, if the whole website is 50% off every single day, you know, besides Black Friday and Christmas, that's also a red flag, right? That's it's just too low to believe. And trust me, I, I do this for a living. So I go on these websites. That's something that's a red flag to look out for when the prices are too low. Because if you look at, if you Google it somewhere else, the price is obviously more legitimate. So that's a red flag for a website. And then the privacy statement. This is sort of an easy one to catch and also an easy one that the fraudsters don't put in. So at the bottom, that's basically telling you they're going to save your information. They're not going to sell it as what they tell us. And they're going to take care of everything that you put in there. So when these fraudulent websites create a website or these, or these people that want to defraud you, they never put that in there. It's always something random at the bottom because they just don't understand the concept of having a legitimate website. So these are some red flags when you look at a website that is essentially fraud from top to bottom. And if it's missing some of these, you shouldn't shop in there at all, regardless of you're sort of convinced um, that it's basically it works. And let's just say, for example, maybe they do send out a product here and there. It doesn't mean they still can't sell your information or steal your information, right? So maybe it's a fish. Maybe they're doing sort of small purchases and they're still trying to get you to eventually sell your information on the black market. So it's one of those things. If these are on that website, please don't shop there. So these are something that's happening, the password phishing scam. So we know these, the fake password reset, the package, you're getting a package in a text message, text offering rebates, fraud alert phishing, and disaster phishing, meaning there's a disaster, please donate. So one thing I want to make clear about these text messages, they're misinterpreted as, oh, it's just sort of junk mail. No, it's a text message with a link that wants you to click on it so that you go to a fake website that looks like the website you're supposed to go to that looks legitimate. So you can put in your username and password, and now they have your information. And then here's the next goal. They want to get to your email because now they want to get to your bank and they'll reset your bank password to your email. So they first will lock you out of your email, which is like locking out of your house, right? And when they're in your house, then they start, you know, looking for the codes and looking for the rest of the stuff. So when that's the sort of the goal, the goal is to get your email address and password changed. So then they can start fishing around at your accounts, look through your emails and go, where does she have uh, banks? Where do, where do they shop? Where can I get username and passwords? 
forgot username. Now you got the username. Forgot password. Now you got the password. They have they locked out your email and now they're saying you're pulling your information. So these text messages are the Trojan horse to get in. That's the point. They want you to click on it. They want you to go to fake Bank of America website where it looks legitimate. You put your username and password and it says wrong password. It's not the wrong password. They just took in the token. They took in your username and password. And now they're going to try to get the rest of your information. So these, the, the advice you hear me, and I'll say it at the end, don't answer the phone and delete the text messages. That is 50% of the fraud that you're not going to, that you're going to prevent. Don't ever answer the phone. Just, just don't do it. It doesn't matter if, even, if it says Bank of America. And I'll talk about that later. And don't respond to these text messages. And again, I'll talk about some tips on how to avoid these phone calls and these, and these text messages. But you guys have all gotten these, right? All of these here. Here's Bank of America, not even a legitimate number. Uh, there's a link. Here's suspicious activity on my account. That's not even a real email, you know, a, an account with a, with a link. Here's another PayPal. I have PayPal. Click here to access your account. And of course, you know, you know, someone in Russia got my information from Amazon. Please call. And I take a lot of these phone calls. I don't click on these, but I do take these fraud phone calls. And they're all the same. They're all fraudulent. There's not one ever that's real. So when you get these, just delete them. If it's really happening, if fraud is really happening, and most of you have experienced this, it happens instantaneously. Because I travel a lot, I go to random gas stations to get gas or get snacks. My card would decline. And instantaneously, I'll get a text message. Were you trying to make a purchase? Yes or no? I put yes. Please resubmit your card. It blocked me because obviously I left my hometown. I'm six hours away. That's the only time you'll ever get a text message from the bank when you're there trying to make a transaction and it will block it because you're somewhere else. All these other text messages that you get, they're not real. And if they and if you think they're real, you can call yourself. There's no need to click on these at all. So the only time you'll ever get a text message about fraud and if I've ever experienced is in that moment when I'm at a gas station uh, up and by the Oregon border. Of course, it's like, what are you doing in Oregon, buddy? I'm, like, I'm going to give you a presentation. It's me. I need I need some snacks and some gas. So obviously, you know, it, it gets approved, but that's the only instance where you should think of, of these texters being legitimate. Uh oh Okay. Okay, so another one that, that they're getting really good at is for the email scam. This is a, this is something that I started noticing and getting them. I use PayPal, but they're starting to send invoices that look legitimate. So this is something that is very scary because it can trick you because I actually took a second look and said, what is this? I owe this. And so here, this is the one that everybody, every, I shouldn't say everybody, seniors get trapped in is the McAfee protection plan. So here's an invoice from the billing department. And then here's an invoice number. Here's a date. And it's McAfee protection. It looks good to you. You put pay now. And as soon as you click that, obviously I have PayPal. You can go ahead and give the fraudster money and now you paid a legitimate invoice and your money's gone. And one thing that I know and most uh, corporate accounts can do this, I can do it now, is with PayPal, you can create any kind of invoice. Like I can invoice you guys right now to pay me. Like, oh yeah, Fernando said he was gonna charge me $5. I'll just pay him, right? And, and you're gonna give it to a fraudster, but I can create an invoice right away. And so this is the email that came through. Obviously red flags, it comes from a hotmail but it still looks legitimate and it comes for gift cards. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you look at, and then there's the next screen from this one is we're just telling me to pay for the gift card and pay now. And so for one of these things, imagine this, they send it to 10,000 10, people and about maybe 20 of them pay them. They won. They got their money. They made, even if they made a hundred bucks for sending out a bunch of emails, one of, one of someone, you know, is going to send on the invoice because it looks similar or they got access to your email and they know you went to a mechanic. They're going to copy the mechanics information and send you the mechanic invoice. Oh, that's, I thought I paid them. Hmm, let me just pay that invoice. So they're doing this now legitimate. And the, and the sort of thing that's sort of not the best for PayPal, PayPal says, if you don't know them, just erase it. So there's not even a fraud warning when an invoice comes like this. Of course, this is just one example, but you can get multiple invoices that look legitimate. I look out for them because obviously they're not legitimate invoices. Okay, so one of the things that's happening to most accounts now, if you haven't heard about it, maybe some of you guys might, is a two-step verification. So essentially it's your username, your password, and once you plug that in, it gives you a code and you put that into your computer or your phone. For my uh, work uh, computer, I have to do a two-step verification in order to access my computer. So what's the, the benefit of this? As it says here, even if someone else gets your password, it won't work to sign into your account because they don't have your physical phone. So they, have your, they, they reset your password, they have your username, and they try to log into your account. And as soon as they log in, you're getting the text message to plug in the code. Well, they, can't, they don't have access to your phone, so they're not going to get in. So if a organization or a company or a bank says, do you want to set up two-step verification? 
please do so. This will protect your account. For, and this, ha and this happens all the time. It's not something new or old. It's just the companies have to roll out the security. Um, the state just rolled out to check out our W-2s and our, and our paychecks every month, a two-step verification process. So even though I work for the state, they just did it now. So essentially, I will now have to get a, and I'm going to do it, I will now have to put in a text message into the computer to access my W-2s or my pay stubs. And so it, they roll out as they come. And so just be aware that if, it, if this company, any company says, please sign up for this, please do, because essentially if the fraudsters have all your information, they don't have your phone. So you're going to be safe. Another layer of protection for your information. Now, like I, like I spoke earlier, so this is something that's happening now. It's the new cash. And it's, I say money transfer because we know we call it Apple Pay, Ven, Venmo, PayPal, Zelle, Google Wallet. This is a money transfer. They're, they, I think they mask it in a way of telling you of convenience. But uh, back in the day, and most of you, if you bought a house, they do a, a wire, right? You transfer the money. And if the wire information is incorrect, you're going to give it to somebody else. And the, you're never going to get it back unless they give it back. This is the same thing. When you start giving and sending money with a, these apps, it is from your debit account to their debit account. The money's gone. And that's how they're defrauding a lot of consumers now, because essentially this is the fastest way to get your money because it, it's direct money with debit card. And so as you can see the breakdown, it is coming in line with cash to a 50-50 split. So you just have to be aware that obviously they're moving away from cash. And the perfect example is the River Cats here in Sacramento is a cashless stadium. You cannot go to the River Cats game and pay with cash, only debit or credit card, right? So they're changing. So technology is changing. They're finding it less convenient. And if you're sort of not aware of it or uncomfortable with it, just know that it's 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 shifting to that area. So you should learn a little bit about how to use apps if you're going to use them in the future. So this is the one that's happened a, a lot. And if you just, you, whenever you're bored, go to YouTube and type in Zelle fraud. There will be thousands of stories of people getting defrauded by Zelle. So essentially Zelle is another form of peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. So it's like Apple Pay or Venmo or Google Wallet, you know, whenever you're giving money. And so it's, it's just basically a payment to a payment. And so what they're doing is they're giving you this kind of text message here and you reply no. And they said, okay, go click on this link to sort of access, uh, to clear your account, you put in your information to your Chase that looks like a Chase website. And then what they've done to not get caught is they bleed $350 an hour because there's no alert of fraud. So they have access to your account. And, and because you are using Zelle, which is a peer-to-peer, -peer, you are debiting another debitor. It is not a credit card. So you are willingly transferring money wiring money to this fraudster. So the bank says it's your fault because you are sending money to another person. And that is basically like a wire transfer. We're not going to reimburse you at all. That was you doing it. And because they sent you this alert, people sort of get scared. They click on it and it looks like a legitimate website, protect your information. And now they're getting, you're getting defrauded per the hour up to, you know, there's some consumers that lost $20,000 in a couple of days. And so like I said, YouTube it, they're all there. And so this is a, a scary thing because you don't need to have Zelle. All they have to do is have Zelle and then they're going to have access to your account. It's just Zelle is a way. There is some information that for, for whatever reason, it's there was a congressional hearing a couple months ago where Zelle specifically used by all major banks where they didn't have an answer of why they're being targeted. You know, they're being targeted because there's a vulnerability in this text message. They're just not admitting it. And they, they told the sort of congressional hearing, the, the personnel on the board, that they didn't know what they were doing yet, but they're going to help the protection. So just, you know, like my recommendation, I love these apps. I love PayPal. I would say never use Zelle because it's it's the number one. It's the number one from getting defrauded. And so this is one of the things that are, uh, that is interesting of, of fraudsters. It, yes. None of those are ever real. And if you ever have a message of fraud, even if it's legitimate, call them yourself. It'd be again, and I've only have it happened to me a couple of times uh, when I go to gas station. And then when I was getting married, I made a very big purchase for the DJ and Golden One said, we're not going to let you. And I called and said, hey, I'm trying to uh, you know order this DJ for my wedding. They said, OK, we're going to let you only have a 12 hour access to pay for that DJ. So even that time it happened to me, I still had a call because they sort of blocked the transaction. But these kind of stuff, does, these kind of interactions are not real, but they sort of scare you because this is something that alerts everyone about losing money. So it's one of those things. They can if you put it in. So that's why I say, even if you think it's legitimate, 
just erase it and call. We don't need to have a, a, a text transaction or a text exchange with anybody unless they, like I mentioned earlier, they block you immediately. And so this is one of the phone calls I took. So this is another way of, of a, a Zelle scam with paying your bill. So here, I'll, and I'll describe the story. It says pay bill at smud.com. So uh, someone from smud called me and said, yo, money, but I'm not going to ask for your credit card or debit card. I'm not going to ask for your information. He said, yo, this amount of money, this is your account number. He actually knew my account number. I, I logged in to smud right away. He knew it. I was like, okay. And it was very nice. Had no accent. So I was like, okay, it's an American accent. And, tell you, and, have, I, and he says, I owe money. Because, all right. And, and you're going to, and he asked me if I had Zelle. I said, yes, I didn't have Zelle. So I logged in and, and, and hooked up Zelle to my bank within like one minute. They said, type in paybill at smud.com. And I said, okay, this is to pay my smud, right? He's like, yeah. And there it was. This is my checking account information. And here I am about to transfer money to a fraud account and pay my smud bill and never get it back. And this was one of those things where I couldn't believe where instead of taking your debit card or your social or your credit card and you're sort of, you're giving information, he's making me put in either an account or a phone number, and then I'm going to, I'm going to wire transfer him money, and then I'm going to lose out that money. So it was a different type of uh, 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 fraud that I was used to. Usually you can pick them up because they have accents and usually they're very pushy, right? This guy was very slow, very meticulous, there's no accent. And he's like, hey, you're going to do it all on your own. I'm not going to ask for anything in from any information from you. And so that was new. And then I said, hey, I don't feel comfortable. I'm going to pay it online. He's like, well, if you pay it online, we're going to cut off your ele electricity. You know, and I, you know, and I said, oh, well, you know, I've never heard of, you know, paying uh, my SMUD bill. Uh, through Zelle, but you know, I just feel more comfortable. I paid it online, and then he just, of course, hung up. He knew the sort of the gig is up, but I took the phone call. But it was one of those very sophisticated because essentially, it's it's if you're if you don't know, pay bill at Smud is pretty good. It's a pretty good email address. It's pretty legitimate. And so sometimes they'll give you phone numbers, a nine one six number, and they'll give you something that make you believe, like like let's say it's like uh, Smud LLC, right? Something convincing, something that maybe you don't know about that can happen. So just be aware of that. They're actually calling you, making you do it yourself. Hence, you won't get the money back. So to finish my point up with the wire transfer, during the pandemic, it happened a lot. And the banks were refusing to give a refund because you agreed to that wire transfer. And so slowly, they've been refunding consumers when the consumers go to the news stations. So if you look it up, when they complain to the local news and do an investigation, the bank will refund the money. So they'll refund the money, but not give an official policy. And they're still going to tell you it's your fault. You know, you did the transaction. So we're not you refunding you. They're refunding consumers, but not telling consumers at all. So just be aware that they're doing it, but they're not doing it willingly. And oftentimes it also requires an official report. And so I don't want to get too off topic, but for example, if there's ever an issue with a, with a, with a national bank, I had a consumer ask me this question. I said, please submit an FTC report not just an internal report with the bank because the internal report moves at their process. An FTC official report of fraud, the FTC lawyer says, excuse me, this consumer said they were defrauded. What are you doing with their report? So now they have to answer the official government entity about what's going on with the report. And trust me, when the cons I, I let that consumer know, they were waiting, I, I believe, three months for some kind of internal investigation. As soon as she submitted the FTC report, within 15 days, they had an answer and they told her, we're sorry it took so long. We're going to resolve your fraud. It wasn't you. We're going to give you back your money. So making an internal, uh, an external report to a federal agency or state agency does help along the line. Oftentimes, I get the question like, you know, no one ever does anything or nothing ever happens. Well, that's because no one ever files complaints, right? There's no system that is, there's no system that is perfect. But if we don't file these complaints, no one can do anything or look into it. So that's one of the things we want to. I want to make sure you guys always do. If it's not a federal or state en entity, please file a complaint if there is somewhere to complain to. Um, and I'll give us one slight story because I love to I love to give it. Uh, my wife and my sons were at the grocery store and this grocery store had bathrooms, but not open to the public, although it's illegal. And we knew it because I sort of grew up going to that store and like, nope, that's uh, we don't have restrooms. And of course, uh, they, they denied it and we knew they're there, but they sort of don't have access uh, you know, to the public. And so we had to find somewhere else. And then I said, I told my wife, don't let it go. So we we called the city. We figure out who's in charge of sort of the, the regulations. And we said, hey, this is what happened. We filed a complaint. And then a week later, or a couple of days later, the I don't know if it was the city manager, uh, forwarded the email. He sent directly to the building owner and the business manager saying, it is illegal to not have access, public access to restroom for your consumers when you sell goods or whatever. Please rectify the situation or else, you know, you know or we're going to have to talk about what's going to happen. So that single complaint 
allowed for now the store and the building manager to know you must fix those restrooms. Although it's inconvenience to you, it is illegal to not have public restrooms. And just by filing a complaint. And then we were sort of proud that we just didn't let it go. It was my two kids. You know, you got to let the two kids go to the bathroom. They don't, they don't know when they have to go to the bathroom. So that's kind of the power of a complaint, right? Just doing something can change the trajectory of a store to, you know, help consumers. So that's kind of what I'm saying. You had a question? Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So here's here's what one of the, uh, one of the uh, that I want to give a, a give a quick sort of uh, a breakdown of what you get the money back. So here here it says here percentage of survey respondents who were able to get their money back through payment processing companies. So look at no surprise, Zelle is at the bottom of getting your money back. Right. And so here are the sort of online payments, right? PayPal, credit card. Of course, a, a PayPal and a credit card. This is a, you guys. You guys know this. You're a lot older than me. Uh, when you use your credit card, that's the bank's money, not your money. Right. So if there's fraud, they're going to fight to find out their money. They're not there. They don't. You know, the debit card, obviously, they're a little slow because that's your money. But it's one of those things that you guys know this already. When it's their money, they're going to fight to get that fraud. When it's your money, they don't really care. They're going to tell you to take them six to eight weeks. But, you know, if the, if the bank's been defrauded, all of a sudden they have an urgency to get their money back. So here is the sort of the percentage of getting your money back. And again, stay away. I don't I don't care if they ever you know find out that I'm saying they're negative. Their, their statistics say they're a bad uh, a, a company to use like a, a payment payment uh, person to person transaction. OK, so here's a this is sorry for the, the sort of word vomit up here. And of course, this is for for your interpretation to sort of look at later, but these are some protections. The two-step verification we talked about in the first bullet point, then recognize social science with social engineering. Most scammers are working, trying to establish sort of rapport, right? They're calling you, they're talking to you nice. They sort of have an urgent message. Your, your bill is due. We're going to cut off your power, right? And then check, and then of course, check your, your credit report. Again, that's sort of making sure no one's defrauding your account. If you're sort of doing a lot of transactions online, Double check requests for unknown recipients. Again, don't don't ever take the the free money, the cancellation payment. I sent you two to hundred bucks, and you send it back. So double check when they ever try to do that, and you get these random requests. This is something that I did. I saw something uh, on Facebook Marketplace, and someone overpaid me. And I said, okay, I understand. You only paid me by twenty bucks. You went away. I said, I'm gonna give you back your money online, but make sure it's you. I'm gonna send you one dollar. And here it says, you know, make a one dollar wire transfer to make sure it's them. So essentially, let's say you do you are paying something with these apps and you're not so sure how to use it. Well, and you're going to pay something, you know, a couple hundred bucks. So, OK, I'm going to send you a, a one dollar. Let me know that you received it because this is the only way you're letting me pay you. So let me send you a dollar and let me know that you got it. So now that you have the verification of that one dollar sort of transfer, now you have a little more ease of sending maybe the five hundred bucks or the hundred dollars or whatever it may be. So try that if you're really forced to use it. I knew a consumer; she was a lot older, very uncomfortable with a, a payment. I think it was Venmo, but that's how she got her rent money from one of her tenants. So I told her if you ever move over to a different sort of uh, way of payment, just sort of do a test payment. Try it for a dollar whatever is sort of the minimum allowed. That way you learn a little bit how it works and you know that's legitimate. And, and this is one of those things that uh, it's getting a little bit into sort of the weeds. You know, with Venmo, you can use a credit card with a fee. So obviously a lot of these uh, uh, payment services are with your debit card. So, and it's unprotected again, because it's sort of like a wire transfer. Venmo does allow you to use a credit card, but it, it charges you a 3% fee. So that's it. just in case you're not really comfortable using your debit card with some of these um some of these payers, you can use Venmo that allows you to do a, a credit card connection if you're interested. And again, just to, for knowledge. Okay, this is this is one of those, uh, you know, if you're ever on Facebook Marketplace, so these are the, these scams here. So here you have a $1,000 scooter for 100 bucks. Number one red flag, right? That's not real. And then, of course, then it's reading here online. Please don't buy it on Facebook. Buy it on our website. And number two, red flag, getting you to go somewhere else. They don't want you to buy it on Facebook because Facebook does have some protection when you purchase stuff on there. And then another red flag here is my favorite one is this PayPal one. We support PayPal. Please use PayPal. One thing you should know about PayPal, whether they're a very good credit card company or not, is that what fraudsters know is when you use PayPal, PayPal sends them the money and then you don't ever get your product. Then you tell PayPal, hey, I never got my product. They go, okay, we're going to do an investigation. Fraudster never replies. PayPal blacklists them, closes their account, gives you back the money, and they kept the money. 
So that's why they put PayPal because they know that they're going to get to keep the money. They essentially just PayPal just closes their account and then they create another one and do it all over again. So they, they know to use PayPal because PayPal allows them to basically keep the money and blacklist them. So a red flag is someone's telling you, oh, we take PayPal, PayPal, PayPal. And the reason is there's sort of soft security protections with PayPal because it sort of allow it's used on eBay majority, but like a bank, for instance, they have better protection. I guarantee you, if you try to buy this product on a website with your credit card, it'd be blocked right away, right? Because it would have certain protection that's not real. PayPal lets things slide, and so the scamsters know it. So whenever you see these sort of ads to buy stuff, and they and even if they like, uh, they don't want you to move to different places, or they sort of selling you something too cheap. If they're really pushing the PayPal, just know that most likely fraud. Okay, so this is some statistics for you guys to uh, to learn a little bit about. This is reported, and this should scare you because this is. Um, and I'm not going to say most of you are over sixty. I think you guys are right there or lower, you know, but. Uh, that, just a little bit of comedy before the terrible, the terrible numbers. Reported victims in 2020 were 92,000 victims, 1.7 billion loss in fraud for over 60. So that's telling you that every day somebody here, even in Sacramento, is getting defrauded every single day. 1.7 billion in losses, and of course, the average loss, and you know, this 18,000, 100,000 or more was 3,000 victims. This number is way higher because most people who get defrauded are embarrassed and they don't report it. So again, this is reported number. I think this is a lot higher. So this is something to look out for because you guys are being targeted every single day, every single day. And a lot of the, uh, the people I work with are all seniors or veterans. So there's a pension and there's social security. There's guaranteed money that you have that a regular person does not. Uh, often seniors are alone. Often seniors are don't know what technology. So you're the number one target and that's why the numbers are so high. So the worst part is California is number one with half a billion. So it's $427 million lost. So we are the number one state. So obviously Florida's behind it with the retirement home, but we still double them, right? So that's letting you know that we uh, here in California are getting defrauded. And again, and this is reported, I believe this number to be higher. So it should scare you and you should pass this information along to other people that are, are not in the know is that you're being targeted for fraud every single day and they're defrauding you and they're taking money. They're bleeding money slowly and surely uh, with different methods. So some of the top methods here, again, reported is tech support. So 13,000 victims, again, that might be higher. And then I think the social media one is a little bit higher too because of social media is so inherited, inherently used, but also underreported because of embarrassment and because a lot of it has to do with romance scams. We have some slides about that. So this number might be higher. And so here's just the, the, the basic fraud that happens here how, uh, by the numbers. So number one is tech support or I should say fake tech support. And so here is the, the, the what they do is essentially they tell you that you need to, let's see, where is that? Um, it's here somewhere, sorry. It is telling you, oh, they offering you, a, a, a company offer you a non-existent technology issue or, or renewing your fraudulent software, right? So here's a tech support and here's the messages that we get, right? So your computers may be infected and they call you and they say they're gonna fix your computer. And so oftentimes what they do is they take hold of your computer, you download software and then they take control. Then they log into your bank. They sort of, if you go on YouTube, they put fake screens on your computer screen or what you can see. And so that's how they slowly bleed you. So the tech support is the number one. The McAfee, everyone's trying to update their McAfee, update the uh, fraud support. So this is sort of the, the, again, reported number one thing that happens to seniors is a fake tech support. If you ever see some of these warnings, I always tell seniors, please just turn off your computer. Turn it off, do a hard reset, push down the power button and let it turn off. It's going to go away after you turn it off. And if you're really worried about getting a, a, a virus or you think you're not, your computer's not working, go to a local computer shop and see if they can fix it. Also, second word advice to that, stand there and stay there. If it's sort of your computer is like your house, why would you just drop it off to someone you don't know and have them fix it? And so you let them know, hey, my, my computer is acting up. Can you fix it? And I'd like to see, I'd like to be here while you're doing it. You know, if you don't mind, there's a lot of personal information on my computer. And so if you ever need to fix it, I'd go to that or sort of a reputable company like, you know, Best Buy. But if you ever, if you ever need help with your computer, please take it in, but also stay with your, your devices unless you trust the person or know them from a reference that they can help you. So romance scams, the, the stuff that nobody likes to talk about. It's embarrassing and it happens a lot. So these are the numbers uh, of 70,000 70, people reported romance scams. It's obviously it's grew 
to 1.3 billion in losses. Average loss is $9,000. And again, that is real. She's not real. And that is real. And so uh, a, a interesting story that I heard uh, when I do, I do these for these uh, veterans uh, that some of the prisoners from uh, federal prison on their rec time will go to the library and create fake accounts and target veterans. Right. And so there is so that like the CHP gave a report. And I, I talked to one of the person that's a counselor at these veterans homes. And it's like, there's someone that will do their rec time and it basically it's a fake female account. So this is just to know that this is on the rise. Obviously COVID hit and uh, it threw the roof because everybody was secluded and sort of to themselves. And so this was uh, something that happened a lot during COVID. And these are the numbers, as you see, from 2017 to 2021, it's it's continuing to rise the number of, of losses for romance scam. Again, it's one of those things that no one likes to talk about because it's embarrassing, because people don't want to admit they're lonely because they're older, because nobody talks to them. But, you know, if you can support your, your peers or those who you know that maybe don't talk about it, it might be happening to them. It might be a slow bleed or uh, in, in a big amount. And sort of obviously, that, like I spoke earlier, and the worst part is that they're not going to report it. So they're getting defrauded. They're losing money even slowly or big, big chunks, and they're not going to tell you about it because they're so embarrassed or they believe the person's real. So, you know, like when I talk to veterans, they believe it's real. They believe this this person from this other country really wants to, you know, marry them. It's not real, right? And so, unfortunately, we have to sort of help them understand that these accounts are fake and so that, you know, giving any money to any person online is, is not going to do any good. So again, this is one of those things. Romance scammers, the main strategy is to create a fake profile using pictures from someone else. They're, you know, they're asking you to move the communication. The red flag is off the app because basically once they move it off the app, they can't get uh, in from, uh, I get red flag for maybe being a scammer if, if they get found out, right? Another one is showering you all the top affection, flattery, gifts, praise early on in the relationship. You know, this attack is called love bombing. So essentially it's it's there to manipulate you, to get you to your emotions, strike really quick. This relationship is going really fast. I love it. It's great. She loves me. We're going to get married. They do that, right? And obviously telling you that they're working or traveling outside of the United States. They're always overseas, right? They're never in your local town. And yeah, so again, those these are red flags for these uh, the romance scammers. And so some of these the, some of these bullet points here. Okay, after gaining trust, credibility, your affection scammers will ask you to help them by sending them money. The scammers claim they need money to uh, plane tickets to travel or to come visit you, right? And then, of course, the plane, the flight gets canceled. They ask for money to pay for surgery, medical expenses, or for their family members. The scammers ask you to pay for uh, custom fees to receive something or, or, you know, money for, you know, to get rich because they know somebody. Then they ask you to pay for their phone bill or the laptop because they want to keep communicating with you. And also, they claim they need your help to pay down their debt so they can start a life, a life together, right? These are all things asking for money. What different thing you know can be produced to get to pull out the heartstrings? It works, right? It, it, there's still people are losing in the billions with these with these requests, and so it's really easy. Cyber sweetheart, what are they sending you? They they say they're far away. Number one, their profile seems too good to be true. Yes, that beautiful twenty year old is not calling you or texting you. That's that's not her. You know, their relationship is moving really fast. They want to marry you. They want to get to know you. They want to you know be with you. You know, they break the promises to see you. Of course, they're going to always break the promises to see you because they're not real. They're not going to come visit you. And they ask for money. And then they require specific payments like Zelle, like those apps, right? So they can only get paid a certain way. So they're looking for the best way to create a fake account and then get a, a, a form of money wire because you cannot say that they're defrauded you. So again, if it's not you, you know, send this to someone else. If it's you, red flag, you know that this is not real. It's, it, you know, stop, think, you know, observe and proceed. It's just say not, do not proceed because we know that it's not real. But, you know, again, we got to help each other out and just have these difficult conversations with people that we know. Okay, so finally to come back to us uh, about DFPI. Again, we are a, a state agency that does consumer complaints for it, uh, for illegitimate or legitimate complaints. And I say that because you might think it's something small. You might think it's something not worth uh, making a complaint about. I would encourage you to call the number if you think it's something financial related. And if it's not us, we'll refer you to the right state agency or the federal agency because our job is to answer your question and to get you to a right state agency. In the back of your guys' book, uh, there is a consumer, there's a couple of consumer protection agencies let me open it up real quick. So here, 
here are some consumer protection agencies, not all of them, that can help you with different things of how to look people, how to look up people's licenses for contractors, for lawyers. Again, there a lot of people don't use the state agencies for these protections, and we're there to help you to protect you from any kind of person trying to take your information or your money. I work very closely with a contracting licensing board, and they have all these horror stories of people of people getting defrauded by contractors. Well, if you call the contracting board to figure out if they have a legitimate license and they don't, or there are certain rules to, to maybe have a license with the contractor, there is someone on the call center that's going to help you walk you through what a contract should look like. There is someone that's going to legitimately, if he's a legitimate contractor and maybe sort of does a disservice to you, they will file a complaint against their license. And if they don't make it right, you can get your money back or they will lose your license. So but we need to get these complaints in, right? And that's just one of the partners that I work with. And so there's a lot of state agencies that can help you. We just got to hear your phone calls. And so for us, obviously, we're a financial institution. We take in this complaint. And so if you ever think you need a complaint against any kind of entity that we regulate, file a complaint or give us a call because they have to answer your questions. And so here's some information about us. Our website, dfa.ca.gov. Our number, it's on your pin, it's on, it's in the book. And then our email, ask the FBI. And then really good stuff. I'm gonna promote it and we're not gonna ever spam you. This is our our newsletter that we create as an office that is not a private entity, not some public affairs firm that we hire. It's me, Lisa, Ku, Sally, Jackie, all of us in the office get together every Friday and we get a, a newsletter of different scams that's happening. And we produce it every month. And so we are, it's us. It's me producing something. You know, when Veteran Day comes up, I look for veteran scams. In Memorial Day, same thing. So it's us looking for the latest scams and producing a newsletter to send out to consumers. So if you're ever interested in getting sort of a monthly, just sort of a fraud alert scams of the latest scam that we've seen, you know, just subscribe to our newsletter. It's really good. We will never spam you. Um, and if you don't like it, you can just say stop. And if you my coworker, Lisa, that just removes you, right? It's not some entity. So we are here to sort of help your information. And that is it. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we're going to take questions okay. now. Yeah, before we get to the other questions, I had a quick one for you. Um, I know in PayPal, Al, you can set it up so the money comes from your bank account or you can make it so the money comes from your credit card. Is it better to have it come from your credit card through PayPal? So. Um, you can have a credit card and a debit card. I use the PayPal credit. Yeah, so, but, yes. Yeah, but you can set your own credit card up in your PayPal account. Mm -hmm. And then that's the one I usually use when I use PayPal. It just automatically goes. So, so one word of advice, because I know it, is specifically, it's better to use the PayPal credit, the line of credit, because then PayPal has, is more adverse to help you because that's their money. When it's your credit card, it's still your money. So let's say there's fraud. Yeah. So you'd have to go to your credit card company. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. So the, again, they sort of give you the runaround. Yeah. And so, but when you use PayPal, I know I use it. I use my line of credit from PayPal because then they do their own okay. investigation. So that's, cool. it's a better way to do it. Someone had a question over here that, was it you? Someone? Oh, you. Actually, I have two questions now, but I'll go with the second one. First. Okay. All right. Uh, this business of reporting, I had an experience recently, uh, and it's odd because it was with another Renaissance group. Uh, in our group, we share group emails uh, that, you know, they get sent around for me meeting details and such. Uh, I got a, I got a, f what I learned to be a, f a response from a phony email that looked like one of our members. And they positioned it as one of the, our members. Yeah. And he was, and he's a, frankly, he's a, he's one of the, like the oldest guy in group. And he was asking me to buy him a couple of Amazon gift cards because he couldn't figure out how to do it. Yeah. And I thought, okay, I like this guy a lot. I'll yeah. help him out. You know, the old guy help him out. Uh, come to find out in chatting with another member of the group. No, no, that's a scam that already made the rounds. You didn't hear about that? So could I report that fraudulent email to your group? No. Okay. Yeah, that's something that we we uh, we wouldn't do anything with. And to be fair, like nobody does. So the 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 scams are so wide, uh, and it's funny you say that. I remember uh, my, some. I don't know how they did it. Someone emulated my sister's email, and was she was sending me weight loss pills. So like, what the hell is she doing? What it what it? That's so rude. Why would she send me that? That's it's kind of scammy. And then I looked deeper into the email and obviously it wasn't my sister. And I started sending her a picture. I'm like, look at this is funny. It says your name, Veronica Mendoza. And then like, you send me this stuff for weight loss. I was like, oh, that's really weird. I'm like, but it happens. And so again, we just sort of put them in the spam 
and that's it because there's nothing we can do because they're just created like with bots and so there's there's it's nowhere land it's it's the same thing i tell you it's better to not reply Yeah, it's always it's always the email address as a as a slight variation that sort of uh, that gets you. Go ahead. Um, how do you feel about companies like LifeLock? So um, let's see. I'm being recorded, right? Um, if you look, if you do a deep dive, if you do a really deep dive, you see that a lot of these companies that provi provide protection use uh, major conglomerates that are sort of similar and sort of change names and change money and become something new and offer protections. So it's just, it's the same thing like uh, uh, companies that, that use for like to check your credit score or to repair it. It's, it's, if you do a deep dive, it's almost like the same company with a different name. So I don't know if they, if they are the best to use, I wouldn't say that they're, the, that they're not good, but here's a, here's a, a better way of doing some kind of protection without paying for them. You can freeze all your, your three uh, credit bureaus, your uh, uh, your TransUnion, your Experian, your uh, what's the last one? Yeah, Equifax. So you can freeze the account and no one can open it for free. You go online, you answer a bunch of questions. It freezes your account. And I know it works when I try to buy my house. Uh, my TransUnion was frozen and they said, hey, unfreeze your account because we can't process to, uh, to buy your house. So that's like I would say that's the best way to do something because it blocks every kind of opening of account now obviously you're talking about more like identity theft and all that stuff i don't know that they necessarily work because even if you have them if i google your name enough i'll find your phone number your address your mom your dad your brother your sister and and so it's like so what are they doing if all your information still stays out there so it's one of those things that um i won't say it doesn't work but i would say you can do a lot of things to prevent your your online footprint and just be really aware um, uh, of where you're shopping of where you do things and just um unfortunately you have to be proactive and not getting defrauded because it happened at any, at any time. So it's, if you want to, I would say go for it, but you could also do a lot of things to prevent your accounts from being sort of overloaded or overused by just monitoring them or freezing some of them. Uh, I recently received a renewal membership from a local cultural organization. Uh, it's always 40, $40. And uh, I, they said, thank you for renewing your membership for $51.50. So I, I, I thought, no, I, I, I always do it by check. So I, I contacted the organization and they said, well, this, we received this from Stripes. And I said, what is Stripes? And he said, it's like PayPal or something like that, I guess. And I said, well, it's not on my credit card. It's not on my bank account. It's not my checking account. He said, "Well, do you want do you want to do you want us to uh, uh, refund your money?" I said, "Well, how can you refund my money when I <laughs> when I never did it to begin with?" So, uh, have you heard of Stripes? I have, I have not. So, uh, one of those things that I I forgot to make this point is a these and you can also another thing you can Google when you're when you're bored is that a lot of this fraud, even though that might be a not a legitimate fraud, but just want to make this point. These fraudsters get up every single day, Monday through Friday, put on their clothes and go to an office to defraud you, right? And there's YouTube videos of them going to their offices and working in cubicles next to coworkers. And their job is to defraud you for eight, an eight hour shift, right? So what, what protections do you have against someone who does it for a living? You do not, right? They're, they're smart, they're learning. They sort of, they develop an American accent. They, they figure out American likes technology. So I would just know that don't feel bad if it happens to you, but just be aware that someone's doing this every single day, getting company awards, getting sort of praised by their bosses, by, by getting the most amount of commission, right? And so just be, be careful because that's what they're doing for a living every single day is to defraud you. Yeah, I think we have a question. Yeah, for the uh, first question, uh, Doug asks, how do we get a copy of your book? If they're on Zoom, this, yeah. this pamphlet, I have a PDF file that I can send and, and we can send that over. Yeah. So we get mm -hmm. and we, we, everything we have that I have physical form, I have a PDF version of it. Oh, that's second, same question. There's another one up here. 
is it wise to tell the sender that you will notify the FTC? You could, but I wouldn't do any interactions with people that commit fraud because essentially um, they move around, they change their address, change company. So just submit it if you do have a fraud against the FTC, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't do any interactions with those who try to commit fraud. I have one more is, could you, the person asked, what about using a VPN? Well, if you're going to a bad web. Yeah, yeah. Even if you're using a VPN, that's protecting your yeah, it's protecting yourself from the outside of someone getting your information, but you are accessing the illegal website that is fraud, that is sort of or I shouldn't say illegal, but that might essentially steal your information. So your VPN is useless because it's attacks from the outside and you're willingly going into the website, you're giving your information. That's the mic. Hey, I do. Right here. Oh, okay. Again. Uh the uh the example that you had earlier on the pay smud, I think it was pay mm -hmm. smud, but yes, whatever yes. it was. Uh, I try to do, when I see something that looks suspicious, I'll try to investigate a little bit. If I were to go to like, like that website, would it look legitimate? I haven't, I haven't done it. I just know that. So this is a little bit of, for my lack of knowledge of, of SMUD, they use that's an email address or phone numbers. So they use fraudulent phone numbers. Uh, for example, and, and, and we have questions. One time when I took the call, they gave me a phone number for SMUD, but it was a, a New York area code. So it was a phone number. And then I said, hey, how are you? How am I paying my bill with a New York area code? And they hung up. But, you know, so I don't know. I don't know what they. It, and, and that's the thing that sort of I don't know, because the fraudsters are protecting the information. And then, you know, they're they're then you're getting sort of too deep into like into knowing how they do it, because maybe that's hard to find. Right. I've looked a lot and it's some of this really hard to find because that's their inner workings of the fraud. Hi, thank you. So you had mentioned something earlier about um, thank you. Tech support um, that made me nervous because I just bought my first Apple Mac and I called Apple mm -hmm. for tech support. To yes. Get set up. So when I saw that on there and like that just made me nervous what did you mean by tech support like so i have a question like that i was legitimately working with apple so so here so you bring a good a point so with, when you buy apple it's free for a year and you can buy additional two years of tech support so i would tell you if you ever get one of these warning messages and you're used to calling apple because it's a paid it's a free service for a year and then let's say you pay for it you want more i would say be cautious on the number you're dialing or if you go somewhere or there's an issue but you sort of maybe flip the number somehow and now you think it's Apple tech support and it's not. So for yours, it's, it's, it's interesting because Apple is, is the one of the only companies that does active tech support for all the products that you can buy. And so it, you're safe, but just make sure it's the right number. Now, other people, they don't have tech support, right? They have a, maybe they don't pay for Apple. They have a regular computer. So they're calling a random number on, on your, on your end, you're calling a legitimate number that you're paying for. So I would just tell you to be careful to make sure you dial the right one. And how do you know when you go on a on the website, right? And you look, oh, how do I contact Apple? It's on the official website, so you have to do a little digging. So official oftentimes, website. oftentimes, uh, fake or I should say paid for ads come up first. So, for example, a quick example is like uh, whenever you want to sign up for Xfinity and you type of Xfinity, the number that comes up first is someone that wants to sell you Xfinity, not customer support. Even though you type in. Xfinity customer support, it'll be someone that's trying to sell you that. And I know because it happened to me and I was like, oh, I need customer support. And he asked for all my information to try to sell me Xfinity. And I was like, oh, wait, I got, I dialed the wrong number that hung up and I Googled it again and went in deeper. And so you have to be careful for the first thing that pops up because that's paid ads at the top. Okay. Okay, so, so and I mean, I'm going to stay at the end for the person, the person ones. So just, uh, you know, obviously for the Zoom, but I'm going to stay after a little bit. Go so, ahead. so your your group, are there consequences? I mean, it seems like this is so proliferated. I mean, it's everywhere and it's happening all the time. So, are there consequences when you can find these individuals and can are they being prosecuted or even can they be found? That's it seems, more it seems like why. Just, yeah, we have to we have to combat it. Is there anything that can be done anywhere else or is there anything? Being done? I, I, I do know there's some high profile cases on the federal level, but I would say this. I would say that they're trying that when they're international, there's very little that can be done. And so a lot of these companies have a international sort of uh, protection. And so it's it's it, we attempt to do whatever is U.S. based and there are prosecution. They are they do get arrested. But those stories obviously are are uh, out, the the stories of, of fraud outnumber those sort of success stories. But it does happen 
on a small scale compared to the stories that that all the defraud, the fraud that happens, but not on the on the bigger scale. It needs to be improved. But again, we're combating something that's online that moves every single time. And thank you very much again, everybody. And I will stay at the end if you have some questions. Well, thank you so much, Fernando. This was just so informative and so wonderful. And I'm I'm sure you're going to get a lot of questions uh, right now. <laughs> but uh, as a token of our appreciation, we would like to give you an honorary membership in the Renaissance Society. And we would we will also make a contribution in your name to the Seth Nelson Student Emergency Fund. So thank you. It was wonderful. And uh, let's give him another round of applause. Thank you.